uh, as Katie has mentioned, you know, my part of the talk is going to focus on diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia. How do we make these diagnoses, and um, what are the important aspects of uh, of testing that are important um, early on, and that might impact um, the choice of uh, therapy uh, uh, either upfront um, and also after a remission. Now, what is acute myeloid leukemia? It is obviously a cancer of the bone marrow where there is a normal proliferation of uh, leukemia cells um, or, or stem cells. And they tend to occupy space in the bone marrow that leads to sort of bone marrow failure and the other cells or normal cells are not able to, to grow. Um, and people can present um, with either high white cell counts or they can actually present with low white cell count. Um, most of the time, AML is diagnosed because someone notices a, a, an abnormality in the a complete blood count or CBC that triggers an evaluation of, uh, of the peripheral blood cells and then leads to further workup. Um, AML is a rare disease, but it is among the leukemias, um, uh, it is a more common form of uh, leukemia, the other being ALL or, or lymphoid leukemia. Um, it is a disease of the elderly. The, the age, average age of diagnosis is 67. Um, males are more likely to get it uh, than females. And these are sort of terms that AML can present what we call de novo, secondary, or therapy related. And these, these terms were sort of semantics many years ago, but they are relevant now in the day and age of um, uh, novel therapies and mutation directed therapies. When we say an AML is de novo, it means that it presents without any prior known. Um, blood disorder or chemotherapy or radiation exposure. So it's kind of um, suddenly uh, develops with no prior history. Secondary AML is when someone has a pre-existing blood disorder, for example, MDS or myelodysplastic syndrome or MPN, and that then transforms to acute myeloid leukemia. And therapy related is a specific category that's designated for um, patients that have had prior um, DNA damaging chemotherapy for other um, malignancies, for example, breast cancer, um, and these chemotherapies and radiation therapies um, can in some patients um, cause damage to the bone marrow stem cells and lead to acute myeloid leukemia. It is not, um, uh, common for everybody who gets chemotherapy or radiation exposure to get this disease um, or therapy-related AML, but it, but it is a risk factor. And the reason these um, sort of, um, categories are, are relevant is because all of these have different biologies, um, a different mutational profile, perhaps a different chromosomal um, profile, and we'll talk about all of this individually um, later in the presentation. And now most of the time, as I said, the most common form of AML is what we call de novo, but the, there are exposures that can lead um, to this. Very rarely, uh, AML can be, can be inherited. So most of leukemia is not inherited. It is a sort of an acquired um, uh, malignancy that is common with age um, and age-related mistakes, but um, there are um, rare forms of AML where this is a familial leukemia and patients are born with a gene that makes them at high risk of uh, getting leukemia. So we always want to ask about uh, detailed history of uh, if there are any blood cancers in the family. Um, and that usually gives us an idea if there are multiple family members who, who have it, um, that this is a hint that it might be genetic and there is a separate um, testing that we do to look for some of those um, mutations and that it has an impact in what we do later on or um, whether this leukemia is more likely to come back, transplant decisions, but that is a very rare 
um, generally inherited leukemias is not common. Um, most of it is, is de novo or from other exposures like secondary or uh, therapy related. So now how do we diagnose AML? So someone comes in with, a, um, uh, with an abnormal blood count that triggers an evaluation. We think that we see some abnormal cells or sometimes there is no good reason. The blood counts are low. We don't see abnormal cells on the blood, but it warrants a, um, a bone marrow biopsy. This, the gold standard for diagnosis is, is a bone marrow biopsy. Sometimes um, you can have enough cells in the blood and you can get sort of preliminary results just on, on, on the blood, peripheral blood. But in the end, you still need to um, do bone marrow biopsy to confirm diagnosis and, and uh, uh, orders all of the armamentarium of tests that we, we do. Um, and what do we do once we do the bone marrow biopsy? So the pathologists take it away. Um, and the first thing that you want to look at is, uh, is just by visually, we call it morphology. Visually, you look at these cells and say, do we find these abnormal blasts um, in, the, in the bone marrow? And the, the definition of abnormal for leukemia diagnosis is more than 20%. So if it's more than 20%, um, it's usually leukemia. There are certain leukemias that could be diagnosed even with, when the blast count is less than 20%, but I'm not going to go into you know, too much detail about that. But usually the official diagnosis is more than 20% these abnormal um, blasts or leukemic cells. Then you want to also look at the, the markers on these, uh, on these abnormal cells, and they should be the markers of immature cells, and that's what we do in flow cytometry. It is sort of a machine reading some of these protein markers on the, um, on the, on the blasts and, and, um, uh, and, fig and confirming that these are indeed immature cells because visually something can look abnormal, but it is not the best science, at least nowadays. And you have to look at all of these um, other measures to make sure that we diagnose it. Flow cytometry is also important to mark sort of the, um, the way these cells um, look under the machine, because when, when we talk about remission sample, then we do a repeat bone marrow biopsy during remission, we're able to then look at those cells in details because you know what they looked like before and you want to find out how much of it is left behind. And we'll talk about that later. The other two things that are important on diagnosis is cytogenetics and mutational analysis. And we're gonna um, go one by one about what that is. So what is cytogenetics? Um, um, so chromos that is looking at the chromosomal structure. So we all have 23 sets of chromosomes. Chromosomes are made up of tightly coiled DNA um, structure, which has all the genetic information that is um, that our body has. These chromosomes, they kind of look like these, um, if you can look at on the screen, sort of like an X-like structure. And what we're looking in cytogenetics are big changes, big abnormalities. Is, is part of an arm of, uh, of this chromosome missing, attached to somewhere else? Is it duplicated? Is it gone, like one arm is gone? Um, and those are big structural changes. And leukemia um, cells can have these big structural changes. And when I mean by looking at cytogenetics, we're looking at the leukemia cells particularly. You, you, you obviously have normal cells with normal chromosomes, but we're trying to look at leukemia cells and see what is the um, major sort of chunky abnormalities in, in cytogenetics. And, and all of this is relevant in in making sort of a prediction of how this leukemia is going to behave, number one, and second, um, how the treatment could be tailored based on these chromosomal abnormalities. So that is why we do um, cytogenetics. Now, similar to cytogenetics, um, the second part of testing, which is important, is, is mutational testing. Um, this is done by what we call next-gen sequencing. Um, the idea is leukemia generally has a 
sort of recurrent signature of genes that are mutated. So these are not big structural changes in chromosomes. These are single sort of point mutations um, that are that we can look at. And you can, in theory, look at the whole genome. But usually for AML purposes, uh, most labs are looking at a targeted panel of 200, 500 genes um, depending on the, the panel um, that's available at the institution, but it's a set targeted um, gene panel, and you want to find out what is the signature of that particular patient's leukemia. And this is also important because, number one, it will help understand how this leukemia is going to behave eventually in the long run. And second, again, in the world of newer therapies, targeted therapies, some of these mutations have drugs that specifically target them, and you want to choose the right treatment for the right mutation. So it is very, very important that all of this is, is in back before we make a, make a decision um, on this. Now, there's something that called um, PCR or, or polymerase chain reaction. This is basically looking at certain mutations that um, we have created testing that can look very deeply by amplifying those known um, DNA sequences and look and try to find this um, not only quickly, it's quicker than a next generation sequencing, but also um, more deeply. Um, so you can go to very like one in 10,000 um, kind of depth looking for uh, cells to figure out um, if you find that one cell or not. And the reason PCR is sort of relevant these days is um, next gen sequencing takes somewhere about two weeks to come back. Um, but there are certain mutations you want to know early because uh, you don't want to wait for two weeks, particularly in a leukemia patient. There might be, um, they may be too sick, you need to you know, start treatment um, fast. So PCR is a way of choosing some of the genes that are important um, that can help us choose treatments um, so that that part, 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 the part of choosing the right treatment happens quickly, and then you can wait for the full panel to come back two weeks later. And the genes that are relevant here are NPM1, IDH1 and 2, core binding factor leukemias, and, and in a rare, another form of uh, um, leukemia called uh, APL and also FLT3, um, which is not on the screen, but FLT3. Uh, we'll talk about these mutations, but these are all mutations where in this day and age, either there is standard of care differences or there are clinical trials that might be available that kind of triage patients into if you have an, uh, this mutation, go this trial might be suitable if you have FLT3, this trial might be suitable. IDH, this trial might be suitable. So it's good to have this information. PCR is usually back within 48 hours. So by the time you confirm the bone marrow to have leukemia, you also have the mutational um, information back. And that helps us choose what treatment to go for. Um, now we talk about, so we made the diagnosis based on morphology and flow cytometry. We have cytogenetics or chromosomes and mutations for prognosticating um, how this leukemia will behave, but what are the other things that are important? Um, age, um, generally people who are younger tend to do better um, for reasons that, for several reasons. One, they can handle um, tons of therapies, they can be transplanted, and also the biology of a patient with who's who is older with leukemia is a little bit different than uh, a younger um, patient. So age is, is important. And also there are some clinical factors. How well does a patient look? Do they have heart conditions? Do they have kidney problems? Do there are liver problems? Is there cirrhosis? All of this is important in choosing therapies, which I'm sure um, uh, you know, Dr. Salomon is going to talk uh, next. But this is part of the evaluation that uh, you know, a leukemia doctor would do. And although in theory, there are these scores that are created that if you have this score, if you have you know, heart problem, if you have this, that, um, you, you are eligible for 
uh, more intensive chemotherapy. And if you have this, this, and this, then maybe not. You should go for lower intensity therapy. In reality, a lot of this comes with experience. And a lot of it is sort of talking to the patient, having this some um, gut feeling, whether if the patient looks sick, is it from the leukemia or is it because they were um, just have a lot of comorbidities and medical problems to begin with? And you kind of choose and try to you know, get an assessment of how well a patient might do with chemotherapy. And if they can't, if they have a feeling that they won't do well and they can't tolerate chemotherapy, then the alternative is um, lower intensity you know, therapies. Obviously, over a certain um, age, the high intensity chemotherapy is not given, and I'm, I'm not going to go into details of that. Um, now, I, we have talked about chromosome um, information and mutational information. Why is that important? Um, when you have some of this information back, um, the, the one aspect of it is choosing therapies. Uh, so if you have uh, a core binding factor or favorable, then you choose a certain therapy. Um, if it's adverse, you have a higher chance of resistance mutations and you choose certain therapies based on that. But the bigger aspect of it also eventually is to understand the long-term behavior of this leukemia. And the, we generally categorize this genetic group into favorable, intermediate, and adverse risk, depending on which chromosomes are abnormal or not, and which mutations are present or not. So I'm not going to go into like detailed classification of all of this, but this is what we do actively um, with, with um, leukemia. And this is relevant because for favorable, um, you know, we generally tend to not transplant after a remission. For adverse, if they can handle a transplant and if there is a um, a donor available and the patient's willing, then we tend to generally transplant. Intermediate, um, most of the time people get transplanted. Um, there are some reasons uh, that they may not be, but the, the most important part is that the favorable, we don't transplant because they actually do poorly with, with transplant. So that's why these, uh, these, these mutations and chromosome information is important to, um, to get back and decide uh, a lot of um, discussions around transplant or not happens during that first month of treatment and you start to work it up uh, simultaneously, whether you want to go for transplant or need to go to transplant or not, the, uh, you know, this, all of this workup begins early on. Um, including looking at the HLA type for the patient, looking for the donor, screening um, siblings, all of this is part of the workup of, of leukemia, irrelevant whether we would choose transplant later on or not. Now, although um, you know, this looks a little bit simplistic, um, there's three categories, there's like four, four or five within each category, in reality, leukemia is more complicated and more heterogeneous than that classification that I just showed you. People who have normal chromosomes, they can, this is sort of the spectrum of the kind of subsets of leukemia. So many patients will have this mutation plus this, um, X plus Y plus Z. So it's more complicated and more heterogeneous. And that is why this field continues to evolve as we understand which subgroups behave better, behave worse? How can we make these treatments better? And that is why these clinical trials are so important. Um, just very quickly on some of the mutations because it is relevant to how, uh, how people present. Um, FLIT3 um, ITD mutations are considered high risk. They are about mutated in about one third of AML patients. Um, these, these are aggressive leukemias and generally present with high white cell count, and that is an increased chance of relapse in the future. So it's not about getting them into remission. It's about the ability for this leukemia to come back that makes us worry. And that is why we choose therapies differently for FLIT3 ITD and also the decision to transplant. NPM1 is considered favorable mutation, but there are certain aspects. If it is co-mutated with FLIT3, then it is not um, favorable, that is how much FLIT3 is present and all of that. 
goes into sort of this calculation of whether um, NPM1 continues to behave good risk or it is now pushing it down to intermediate or adverse um, risk. The ideation one and two, I just want to focus on that because these are mutations that are um, targetable and at this point, the standard of care doesn't change with IDH1 and 2 mutations, but there are several cl clinical trials that are ongoing um, and th where there may be targeted agents added that inhibit IDH1 and 2. So sometimes this is actually important to know upfront um, in, in newly diagnosed as well, and definitely in relapsed leukemia. But in newly diagnosed, we still get PCRs to, to understand if they have this or not, and then choose um, therapies. Um, and again, not going into too much detail, but these risk groups are, are actually important because if you have favorable risk, and you're talking about you know, 80, 90% um, sort of survival at a certain um, time point versus unfavorable, then we're talking about under 20% sort of cure rates over time. So that is why this prognostication is important and the decisions that lead from this prognostications, including stem cell transplant is also important. Now, once you diagnose, you go through treatment, and I wanna focus on this just a little bit because it's kind of relevant to what we do up front. Um, once you know if they have certain mutations that can be tracked, like NPM can, NPM1 can be tracked, um, how does that help us in, in monitoring? So when someone is in remission um, and we do a bone marrow biopsy to confirm a remission, we wanna know how good is that remission? is do you have 2% cells? So obviously we look at visually morph, you know, morphology. We look at chromosomes, if they were abnormal before, did they become normal now? We look um, at flow cytometry, th those markers, um, are they gone or not? But based on some of these mutations um, and based on the flow cytometry, we can find out how good of a remission a patient is in. Um, is it you know, so if you look at this, I'm trying to I'll make it simple, that if, if it's a standard remission, it's less than 5% blasts. It doesn't mean that there's no leukemia cells left. There's actually a ton of leukemia cells still left behind. Um, less than 5% of trillions of cells is still a lot of cells. Um, so a standard complete remission is one aspect and you want to get there, obviously. But what's important is can you get to lower deeper remissions where you look deeper and deeper and say, okay, nope, we don't find any leukemia, or yes, we do find one in 10,000 10, cells do have leukemia. The goal is to try to, the world is moving towards, leukemia community is moving towards um, trying to figure out, can we get to the point where leukemia um, can go down, where you just don't detect it and it is so low um, that we've eliminated the clones. And this is relevant um, for purposes of uh, drug evaluation, new drug evaluation, and also how well they'll do in the future. And another aspect of it is how will, would the patient do in transplant? So the deeper the remission, the better the outcome of a transplant. So this is sort of the measurable residual disease or minimal residual disease monitoring, which is important, it's relevant uh, for certain mutations and for, with flow cytometry on, on most, um, um, most uh, patients. Um, and then just quickly on long-term monitoring of AML, we obviously, once in remission, they go through the rest of the therapies, consolidation, you know, Dr. Salman will talk about that, but um, we monitor for relapse, looking at blood counts, looking at some of these PCRs and bone marrow checks. And then you also monitor for you know, long-term toxicity, transplant complication, cardiotoxicity from some of the therapies. And fertility issues, I just wanna point out here um, in a minute, because although fertility issues are long-term, you kind of have to think about that early on when a patient who, who comes in who is young and wants to have children, um, in the future, it is a very, um, it's urgent to treat leukemia. At the same time, we, we try to do as much as we can to preserve fertility. Usually upfront treatment for with chemotherapeutic agents does not lead to long-term fertility issues, but transplant would lead to fertility um, issues. And you try to sperm bank 
um, for males and for females in some way ovarian preservation. Sometimes we have time to do um, uh, you know, egg retrieval. Sometimes we don't have time and we have to just go for uh, um, chemotherapy because it's important to save the patient's life. Um, um, and then um, maybe give some other medications to sort of protect the ovaries. But this is, a, this is a discussion that happens during diagnosis and you take steps towards it um, um, or not, depending on how the clinical situation is. But I just wanted to sort of bring this up that this is something we um, actively consider in younger patients who, who can and want to get uh, uh, pregnant um, in the future. And that brings uh, at the end to my um, talk about um, AML uh, diagnosis.